We're very happy and proud to have with us uh, Eli Strauss, um, who has been a cluster member for quite some time, but somehow never made it really to uh, one of our retreats because I hear he spends a lot of time in the field. And we're very excited that Eli uh, will tell us more about that today. Um, he is a, a member of the uh, Ecology of Animal Societies uh, group and in MEGS department. And uh, yeah, we're just happy that you're here. And uh, without much further ado, Eli, take it away. Thanks. Can everybody hear me OK? Am I coming through on the audio out there? OK. Yeah, thanks. It's really nice to be here and give a talk to such a very full room. So that's exciting. Um, as Alexandra said, I'm a postdoc in the Ecology of Animal Societies Department. And today I'm going to tell you about some of my work on the collective dynamics of hyena societies. And I'd like to start by yeah, thanking some of my collaborators um, on this work, my mentors, um, colleagues on the Mara Hyena Project team, as well as my colleagues in Kenya and the um, institutional and funding bodies that have made this work possible. So when we go out into the natural world, we see animals with these striking uh, traits that allow them to overcome ecological problems. And it's not just the sort of diversity of the traits and their colorfulness that's so interesting about these, but also um, the way that they seem so tu attuned to the environments that these animals live, such that when we look across species, we often see animals who are very evolutionarily distantly related, solving the same sorts of ecological problems in um, similar ways through convergent evolution. So one of my favorite examples of this are the, um, the weaver birds in Africa and Asia on the top row, and the orioles and caciques found in the Americas on the bottom row. These two distantly related spe um, groups of birds weave these pendulous nests that help them defend their offspring from, uh, from nest predators. And so when we see cases of convergent evolution like this, it really is um, an interesting clue as to, to pointing towards the hand of natural selection in shaping these animals and these traits. And some animals solve these, uh, these um, ecological problems by living in groups. And these adaptations often lead these species to become uh, obligately social or highly dependent upon living in groups, such that if you took a quail out of its um, group, it would really suffer significantly uh, reduced survival. And this is something that's not just true of wild animals, it's also true of us. So if we look across, um, if we look at people in, you know, in our own society, we find that those who are less well integrated are at much higher risk for these various um, ailments and diseases. So really suggesting how um, not, it's not just in wild animals, but also in ourselves that sociality has gotten under the skin and really influenced their biology in a fundamental way. <clears throat> And we also see convergent evolution in, in social traits as well as the individualistic traits that I was telling you about before. And a classic example of this is the evolution of eusociality, which has evolved um, over 11 times in insects as well as in uh, mammals and some of these aquatic invertebrates. And in my research, I'm really under interested in understanding the, the processes that give rise to similarity and differences among animals in their societies. And I can break this that question down into the simple, this simple version here. How do societies evolve? This is, um, this is a, an inherently integrative question because it requires crossing uh, scales and levels of organization. Because we know that societies arise from the interactions and behavior of individuals. And the alleles that are evolving, um, or that are changing over time, are all found inside of individuals. But we also know that societies and the structure of societies feed back to shape that shape individual outcomes like health and fitness and other traits. So to answer this question, how do societies evolve, I think we can look at sort of three sub-questions. What is a society like and what makes it that way? How does this type of society affect individuals? And what strategies emerge for navigating the social landscape? So to give you an example of how this question has been asked in some wild animals. We can turn to the goals which have been um, fairly well studied. And here we can say, well, we can ask what is society like and what makes it that way? And um, evidence, so, uh, well, yeah, m studies across multiple species of goals have demonstrated how they congregate in these large breeding colonies during the breeding season. And we can ask, how does this, af this affect individuals? 
And, and researchers have done this by looking at reproductive success of goals living in the colony versus those living outside of the colony, finding that goals that live in the colony have higher reproductive success than those that choose to breed alone. And then we can ask, how does living in this society lead to sort of downstream consequences? And, um, and here, research has shown that, that in these giant breeding colonies, some individuals adopt a cannibalist specialist specialization, where rather than foraging away from the colony, they choose to go and forage on the chicks of other members of the colony. So this is clearly an adaptation that only makes sense in the context of this group living. So we can see how living in a society like this has shaped further evolutionary traits. And there are a few ways that we can go about asking these sort of questions about social structure. And one of them, I'll call this the behavioral ecology approach, where we observe sequences of interactions, like we're seeing here, co-arrivals of birds at a feeder. And using these observations, as observations of sequences of interactions, we can, do in, we can make, um, infer the structure of the society and then ask some questions of interest about that structure. And often these questions end up relating social structure as either a cause or a consequence of individual level variation, like in traits or in fitness. And then an alternative approach is um, using a collective behavior approach where instead of observing sequences of interactions and using them to assemble sort of an in inference about the structure of a society, we can observe um, the behavior of all ind individuals simultaneously and, um, and use that sort of approach to, uh, to understand how the interactions among individuals generate social structure. And in general, uh, and, and these sorts of uh, approaches often lead to questions examining social structure as an emergent feature of interactions among individuals. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, both of these, my work using both of these approaches. Um, and I, my work takes place in the context of the Mara Hyena Project, which is sort of a long-term classical behavioral ecology study, studying the um, behavior of spotted hyenas in the Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya. So here's the location of the field site down here in southwestern Kenya. And w um, myself and other members of the project observe, uh, observe the behavior of hyenas in uh, multiple uh, multiple social groups going back all the way to 1988. And the way we do this is we go out in the morning and evening to observe hyenas when they're most active. And we can identify these individuals based upon their unique spot patterns. So here I'm showing you pictures of two different hyenas on the right. And um, the observers quickly learn to identify these individuals based on these unique patterns. And I think spotted hyenas are a really interesting species to ask these sort of questions about the evolution of sociality for a couple of reasons. First, um, spotted hyenas societies, like, like those of many other animals actually, um, sort of in, uh, live at the center of this tension between cooperation and conflict. So contrary to their reputation, hyenas are actually um, very adept hunters and a single hyena, a lone hyena can go and take down and kill one of these wildebeest and um, begin eating it. But unfortunately, when it does that, all of its group mates will arrive and begin eating it as well. Um, and here we see, um, in these contexts, we see lots of feeding competition to the point where even the individual who, who may have done the killing of the um, animal and this acquisition of the resource finds itself not being able to feed because it's excluded by its group mates. So here we see some clear evidence of um, competition within the group, but they also depend upon each other for, for cooperation. Um, in particular, this occurs in the context of interactions with lions. So here they need to come together and actually cooperate with each other in order to defend resources or uh, steal resources from lions. Another reason why hyenas are really interesting for these sorts of questions is because you would expect that if you went out to the savanna and observed the society of a spotted hyena that it would look something like the societies of sympatric carnivores that it's living with, even closely related species of other hyenas. But this is not a, what we see at all. Instead, the societies of hyenas much more closely resemble the societies of many, um, many African and Asian monkeys. And we call these nepotistic societies because they um, because individuals in these societies have kin-structured social relationships where they prefer to socialize um, and spend time with their kin. And they live in large groups with multiple match lines or multiple family groups. So the, the kin relationships within a group are fairly diverse. Another interesting aspect of these societies is they have behavioral inheritance of position in the social hierarchy. So there's a social, so, um, 
the position in the social hierarchy is acquired through a process of behavioral social inheritance that looks a lot like a monarchy where the um, offspring of a high-ranking individual comes to be is itself ultimately high-ranking once it reaches adulthood. And interestingly, rather than in a monarchy where the highest, where the oldest sibling sort of is the first in the line of um, succession, here we see the opposite pattern where it's the youngest offspring that come to outrank all of its older siblings. And this pattern is, um, is very, very reliable in that following these two rules, we can predict with about 80% accuracy exactly which position in the social hierarchy each individual will occupy once it reaches adulthood. And this is really, I think, fascinating because, first of all, it's, it's weird. And second of all, it's evolved in all these, in not all these different species, but in many of these species which are clearly very um, ecologically and evolutionarily distant. And it gives rise to interesting interactions like this one. Here we're going to see a young uh, younger, uh, younger sister here bullying its older sister. So when you go out and observe these sort of interactions, it, you can't help but wonder why this enormous hyena is putting up with being bullied by, by this much smaller one. And so to, to investigate these, these societies, uh, we can observe sequences of interactions like the one where I just saw where one individual exhibits a dominant posture and the other exhibits a subordinate posture. And by observing sequence, tallying sequences of these um, where we identify the individuals who, who won and lost in these interactions, we can infer something, we can infer the structure of the dominance hierarchy. And this is a sort of field of research that has been ongoing for, um, for over 100 years, so I recently guest edited this special issue where we kind of reflected on the history of this research and also on the future directions where it might be going. And so in the kind of uh, historical approach to, to studying these social structures, one might observe a sequence of interactions and then generate a linear hierarchy like one here where we order the individuals based upon their ability to dominate other members in the group. So here Dave is the uh, highest ranked member of the group, and Shorty is ranked number seven, is only able to dominate Larry. So, um, you know, this <laughs> field of research has, has come a long ways since this um, study and others. You know, here they were using sort of intuition, uh, their, the observer's intuitive um, uh, feelings about how these monkeys related are, are ranked in their social hierarchy. But, um, one thing we identified in this special issue looking forward is that people are becoming more and more interested in not just understanding the ordering of these individuals, but also understanding how these dominance hierarchies change over time. Because identifying dynamics of these sort of systems can be a really great leverage point for understanding the processes that underlie them. So this is the um, sort of approach that, so, so to take a dynamic approach to the same sort of hierarchy, what we can do is um, again tabulate the interactions among individuals and link it with the de demographic information for each of those individuals to know when they joined the group and when they left the group. And in doing so, we can develop a longitudinal hierarchy, which describes the ranks of, of different individuals at different time points, as well as the dynamics that those individuals experience as they move through the social hierarchy. And this is a way to visually depict this longitudinal hierarchy. Here on the y-axis is the individual's position in the social hierarchy, with higher on the y-axis being more preferable. And the x-axis shows the time. Um, and each line corresponds to one individual as they move through this hierarchy over time. So we can call each of these lines a dominance trajectory, charting the path that an individual takes over its lifespan. And in doing this, we can also, um, uh, I've also developed some methods for decomposing these dominance trajectories into its various components. And I'll show you, talk a little bit more about that right now. So if we go back to our sort of simple schematic of a dominance hierarchy here, um, and we ask, we, we might wonder, how is it that Zeke could move up in the hierarchy to become the highest ranked member of the group? And there's really only two ways for this to happen. First, Zeke could challenge Dave and sort of overtake him in the social hierarchy. And second, Dave could die, maybe due to a respiratory illness or something. Um, and then Zeke would find himself as the highest ranked member of the social group. So I call these two types of dynamics active dynamics and passive dynamics, where active dynamics require reversing a previously held relationship and usually results from challenging another individual, whereas passive dynamics 
involve no reversal of any relationship. And instead, this is driven by demographic turnover. So these are two types of dynamics that result from two different processes. And so we can calculate um, active dynamics as the change in the number of individuals that one individual could dominate between time t and t minus 1 with the stipulation that we only count individuals at the two time steps who are present in both time steps. And since these are the only two types of dynamics, the passive dynamics can be calculated as the difference between the total changes in individual experiences and these changes due to rank reversals. And so by doing this, we can actually take an individual's dominance trajectory and break it down into its two components. And by adding these two different components to their starting rank, we can develop hypothetical trajectories that um, an individual would have experienced had they only experienced uh, rank reversals or active dynamics, or had they only experienced these processes due to demographic turnover. And so this is what I did using our long-term hyena data. So here's the uh, dominance, um, the longitudinal hierarchies from four study groups of hyenas. You'll notice that one of them we've been studying for much longer than the other three. And um, so, I, so from this, I extracted the dominance trajectories of each individual, which corresponds to the lines that you see on the plot there. And then I also extracted these two hypothetical dominance trajectories according to these two different, different processes. And then I use these to, um, to understand something about the, the drivers of the dynamics that we see in this plot. So to do that, I fed these three sets of trajectories into a Markov chain, which models um, the transitions through the hierarchy as a function of the individual's position in the previous time step. So by doing this, I can then, I then use this Markov chain to generate uh, many sequences of hierarchy trajectories to sort of plot what the average individual experiences over their lifespan. And this is what that looks like. So here I've generated these sort of sequences over roughly an average individual's lifespan. And what you can see is that um, if we look on the y-axis, I plotted the expected lifetime dominance trajectories of individuals starting at different positions in the social hierarchy. And what you might see is that they're all tending to slope downward over time. And we can actually look at, uh, we can visualize this in a little bit more um, directly by calculating the steady state probabilities of this Markov chain. Here, we're, you can just imagine this as um, if we took this Markov chain process and let it run into infinity, what is the probability of being in any of the different states on the y-axis? And the way to interpret this plot is that the larger the bar is, the more strongly individuals are being pulled towards that portion of the social hierarchy. So here, we both the, Markov, both the steady state probabilities and the, the first plot there kind of indicate this decline in rank over time. So now we can run the same analysis using these two different types of trajectories to understand the extent to which each of these different processes is contributing to this pattern. So if we look at the dominance trajectories resulting from rank reversals or active dynamics, we see that this does not really account for the pattern at all. Um, the lines are relatively flat, indicating that, in fact, active dynamics are having a relatively uh, minimal effect on an individual's uh, rank over their lifespan. But if we look at the uh, dominant trajectories resulting from passive dynamics, here we do see this same pattern that we observe in the overall data, where these lines are sloping downward and the steady state probabilities suggest that individuals are being pulled towards the bottom of the, the social hierarchy. So here we've got, in the, um, in the top here, we have the pattern that we observe in the data. And here we have some indication now of which process is giving rise to this pattern. But we still don't know why is it that dominance that, um, that the demographic turnover is causing a decline in rank over time. And to answer this question, I simulated hyena societies and, and did so so I could turn off very as, various aspects of their biology in order to understand what, um, which, which of those are, giving, are causing the pattern that we observe here. So specifically, I focus on rank-related reproduction, where highest ranking individuals um, reproduce more rapidly than lower ranking individuals, and rank inheritance, this process of, um, of, of the inheritance of position in the social hierarchy. And I focus on these two because they're both involved in how new individuals are added to the group. So what I did is I simulated groups of hyenas um, that reproduce and die, and I parameterized the simula simulation based on the real um, hyena data. 
And importantly, I didn't simulate any competition for status or any interactions among individuals at all. In fact, I just simulated a hierarchy where um, individuals are born and, and they die over time. So there's actually, so all the dynamics that we're going to see in these plots are strictly due to passive dynamics. And then I repeated the Markov chain analysis that I just showed you. So here's what these results look like. Here it is. Um, so I simulated four different types of societies that include all combinations of the presence or absence of these two features. And if we look at the first, this is the hyena-like version with both rank inheritance and rank-related reproduction. Um, I was very reassured to see that my simulation looks exactly like the, the thing that we see in the, in the real world, it, where we see this decline in rank over time. And if I remove these two processes, we see a totally different pattern. Here, rather than um, individuals declining in rank over time, we see a regression to the mean, where in general, over time, individuals mix and have a roughly average, um, equal probability of being in any of, the, um, any of the positions in the social hierarchy. And to make a long story short, if we look at the uh, single combinations of these two, um, if you look at the off-diagonal elements here, where, where we don't have the presence of both of these processes, we again don't see this decline in rank over time. So what this shows us is that, in general, demographic turnover in sort of a, um, yeah, in a, I don't know, no typical situation leads to this regression to the mean. However, if we add in rank-related reproduction and rank inheritance, we instead get this regression to the bottom pattern. And so what this shows is that um, a lot of the dynamics that we are seeing in the social hierarchies that I showed you at the start are due not um, to this kind of uh, process of individuals challenging each other, but are in fact sort of more of an emergent process of the reproduction of other members of the social group. And that this pattern uh, of decline is really driven by the presence of rank-related reproduction and rank inheritance, which changes the effect that demographic turnover has on individuals. And so far, I've been talking about this over individual lifespans, but there's no reason why the process ends at a lifespan because, um, as, I have, as we've been talking about, rank is passed from, one, from parent to offspring such that uh, this really crosses generational lines. So if we look at our longest study group, um, we can and color these lines based on their membership to different uh, females who began, repro uh, different yeah, uh, females reproducing in 1980. Nine here, what we see is that the same process occurs um, across generations. So if we track the descendants of DJ, for example, who's ranked number third uh, in 1989, we see that all of her descendants are relatively low ranking in the mid 20 teens. And it's not because other match lines has o have overtaken her, it's simply an accumulation of the demographic turnover, um, mostly due to reproduction by the highest ranked match line in the group. OK, so I started with these three questions. And like, we, can start begin, we can begin to fill in some answers to these questions. So what is society like, and what makes it that way? Well, what I've shown you is that uh, demographic turnover is a primary driver of dynamics in this society. And rank inheritance and rank-related reproduction modify its effects. And how does it impact individuals? Well, I've shown you that it drives this decline in rank over individual lifespans and over generations. And so I think this has some pretty imp interesting implications for the evolution of life history strategies in this species and also for status-seeking behavior, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about now. So since this slide, we've been focusing ex exclusively on the passive dynamics. However, there, um, let's now look at these active dynamics in the cases where individuals reverse their ordering in the group. And if we look at the rank, uh, if, if we look at the expected lifetime uh, reproductive success, the change in expected lifetime reproductive success as a result of these, um, of these active dynamics, what we see is that many of them have almost uh, no effect, but some of them have quite a large effect. So here, um, the, the size and the color of the point indicates the n-fold change in, li in expected lifetime reproductive success. And what we see is that, um, yeah, there are some that are having quite a large effect on fitness, even though many have quite a small effect. So we wanted to know what are the drivers of these active dynamics. And here I focused on coalitionary interactions or alliances among members of the, of members of the group because this is, um, because research 
in, um, in old world primates that have these nepotistic societies have long suggested that it's these coalitionary interactions like we see here where two individuals gang up together on a third one, that these are kind of um, the glue that underlie these nepotistic societies. However, nobody had yet investigated this in a large, um, in, a, in, a, in the wild in a sort of robust way beyond, um, beyond uh, sort of observations and anecdotal observations in captive groups. So we wanted to know, do these coalitionary alliances predict the active dynamics that we observe, um, that we observe in these groups? So first, to do this, I just looked at whether these coalitionary interactions tended to reinforce the dominance hierarchy or challenge the dominance hierarchy. And what I found is that they almost all reinforce the dominance hierarchy. So these, um, these, these social alliances really tend to, in general, promote the stability of the social hierarchy. However, if we zoom in on those um, cases where they actually challenge the social hierarchy, we see that in two-thirds of those cases, the ones doing the challenging come to outrank the one that they're challenging. And next, I built, uh, I built social networks out of these coalitionary alliances, where each node in this network corresponds to an individual, and the ties among the nodes correspond to the frequency in which they engage in alliances together. And what I found is that pr position in this social network predicted the probability that individuals would challenge the hierarchy, and also predicted an in individual's rise and fall through uh, the hierarchy via these active dynamics. So when this paper came out, I was working with a student named Allie Brown. And she was really interested in understanding what, is the consequences, what are the consequences of living in a society like this. And in particular, we had read this paper recently, The Evolution of Infanticide by Females and Mammals. And here, the authors posited that in societies like these nepotistic societies, where alliances seem to play a really important role, you might expect the evolution of infanticide by females as a mechanism for eliminating the rivals of potential, uh, the allies of potential rivals. And so, alongside um, Benson Pion and Kay Holkamp, we decided to go through our long-term data set to ask, is infanticide by females, is this operating in hyenas, and is it a significant contributor to juvenile mortality, as predicted by this paper? <coughs> So we went through all of our observed cases of juvenile mortality. And it turns out that in most cases, we have no idea what happened. Um, and this is, I think, a feature of mortality. In general, it's such a rapid thing, and um, bodies disappear quickly. So, uh, so in most cases, we don't really know what's happened. But we, do, uh, we did have many different observed causes of death. And we noticed these interesting age structures in the, way, in the uh, relationship between the cause of death and the age at which cubs died, where juveniles who were dying young tended to be killed by infanticide, for instance, whereas juveniles dying a little bit older were killed due to other alternative causes of uh, sources of mortality. So what we did is we uh, we took a we created a Bayesian multinomial model where we're modeling the cause of death as a function of an, of the individual's age at death, and then use this to generate a bunch of predictions for all these cases where we didn't know what happened to the juvenile. And what we found is that um, infanticide and lions were the leading cause of death of juveniles. Um, and we found, and I, and I should also note that in all cases of the infanticide that we observed here, the perpetrator was um, always an adult female. So this is all infanticide by females. So this suggests um, that, as Lucas and Hutch had predicted, the um, infanticide by females is potentially evolved in this society, uh, in, the species, in the species as a mechanism of competition among different family groups. So to come back to this, uh, this slide here, I showed you, I added here that um, the competition via social status seems to be one, a, a process that's driving the pattern where dem demographic turnover is a primary driver of dynamics because these social alliances tended to, in general, reinforce the social hierarchy and actually reduce change instead of driving it. However, I also showed that um, that, that these alliances can drive change, and when it does, they can have a large effect on individual outcomes like fitness. And lastly, I um, provided some evidence that infanticide by females has, may as a, have evolved in societies, in these societies and societies like it, as a mechanism of competition. So I hope that, um, that what I've shown you so far is th has um, emphasize the value that we can get out of 
these long-term studies, these long-term behavioral ecology studies. Um, and one thing that, I, that, that these, um, this, this behavioral ecology approach can't really tell us is about the behavior of the collectives, this, these whole groups as collectives acting in real time. So for instance, um, here we see a picture of two hyenas engaging in a coalition together against this third one. And using our knowledge of the past history, the, the kinship and social history of these individuals, we can say something about why these two are allying together. But what we can't say is how does their alliance right here relate to the behavior of other individuals in this group at this time. And so, um, so here in my ongoing and future work, I'm really excited to bring in more of this collective behavior approach to try and complement the long-term behavioral ecology study with a more fine scale view of what these animals are doing and how it unfolds in real time. And this is why I was really excited to come to Constance, where there's, um, as you all know, a lot of really amazing collective behavior research going on. And so what I'm, so you know, I'm going to end the talk today by talking a little bit about how we're integrating these um, collective behavior approaches into this long-term study. And in particular, I'm going to focus on a, another aspect of hyena society that has also shown convergent evolution with other species. So here, hyenas, like chimps and bonobos, lions and spider monkeys, live in closed fission-fusion societies, which is to say that uh, these societies are spatially a well, are, are socially a well-defined unit in that um, individuals all know each other and um, they defend a communal territory and outsiders are not uh, recognized as group mates. However, spatially they're not nearly as well defined and instead we almost never see all the individuals together and they associate in subgroups that are fluid both in size and composition. And this should be something that's intuitively familiar to us, as all of us are currently here associating in a subgroup together. But as we, as we all know, we haven't been here together all day, and we're not going to leave here all together. So we're, um, like our societies, these animals are very flexible in terms of how they use space and also how they associate with each other. And this is um, really interesting because it gives them a really strong degree of control over how they experience their social environments. So if a chimp or a hyena behaving socially finds that it's um, no longer as into it as it thought it was, or is ready to be a little bit less social, it can decide to go spend time in a much smaller group or even um, go and spend time alone. So it'd be really interesting to understand how these societies work. But unfortunately, there's almost no way to really understand the collective behavior in a system like this through traditional observation techniques. Because imagine trying to observe the behavior of 50 hyenas at once. It sounds really difficult, but it's even more difficult when you can really only ever see a few of them at a time, and most of them are out of sight. So to solve, to kind of address this question, what we're doing is deploying biologgers on all these individuals so we can monitor their behavior simultane simultaneously. And these biologgers um, have three different sensors on them. So we're collecting data on the GPS locations of individuals. We're collecting audio data um, on the sounds that they emit as well as the sounds that those individuals are hearing. And we're also collecting triaxial acceler accelerometer and magnetometer data. So these three sensors, we're, we're deploying them on each individual in a group, and they all turn on simultaneously. So we're collecting this high resolution data um, on all these individuals at the same time. Then we're using machine learning to pull out various aspects of these um, uh, aspects that are of interest within these data streams. For example, here we're calling out, we're pulling out these recruitment vocalizations that hyenas use to gather together to fight with lions when they need to. And we can also use, it to put, use the, um, a similar approach using the accelerometer data to pull out uh, the behavior of individuals. So here, this is actually data from this study here where they identified, um, they identified scent marking behavior in dogs based on these character characteristic um, fluctuations in the accelerometry data. And then most exciting is we can also combine these, diff these three different data streams um, and pull out some more interesting, um, some, some more yeah, socially interesting interactions, like hunting and feeding, for instance, by tracking the movement of individuals via, the G via GPS and then hearing the sound of, um, of hyenas feeding on the microphone, which 
I can assure you is very audible. Um, we're also hoping to pull out social interactions using co-occurrence of GPS points, as well as these um, in combination with these uh, signature accelerometer um, patterns. And then we, we also expect to be able to pull out fights with lines again, um, which should be very obvious on the audio. So this is a process that's ongoing. About this time last year, we were building all of the tags just over there in the Z building. And then um, late last year, we deployed the collars on all individuals in one social group. Then on January 1st, all the tags turned on simultaneously. And while they were on, we collected video data of individuals engaging in social interactions to use as ground truth for the machine learning that I was just telling you about. And then in February and March, we used the remote drop-offs on these collars to achieve uh, to retrieve them and I, and um, so we recently just came back with the data so I don't have too many analyses to show you but what I can show you is kind of this first glimpse of what one of these fission fusion societies looks like um, as a collective so here what we're seeing uh, here to give you a sense of the spatial extent here this box is roughly uh, eight or ten kilometers across so this is unfolding over a really large time scale and what you can see is that there are some events, like the one that just occurred here, that really bring all the individuals together. And these are likely carcasses or interactions with lions. But then they also spend a lot of time on part. In fact, there are some individuals who you can't see on this plot because they're not even within the, the frame, the spatial frame here. So um, we're really just starting to get a good look at, at, uh, at how, these, um, how these individuals are um, adjusting their space use in real time in response to each other, and it's really exciting. So, I can show we, we've um, we've begun digging in a little bit to the uh, to some of the pilot data from this work, where we're identifying um, where we're developing methods for identifying fissions and fusions. So, identifying when individuals come together and when they split using this um, piecewise regression approach, and this is giving us an early glimpse in, or this is giving us some some tools into um, how we might understand how these individuals are making decisions about how to associate with each other. And then um, we can also look at, uh, we also have some early glimpse at individual level variation in space use. So here I've colored these individuals and their home ranges according to their social rank. And what we see is that those individuals who are high ranking are really have uh, quite a small home range and are spending all their time in the center of the territory. Whereas these, um, those individuals who are lower ranking are actually roaming much further, likely as a, uh, which we are pretty sure is a result of competition over access to food. And this work is occurring in, also in the context of a larger comparative study uh, led by Ari here. We just had our retreat last, well, was last week or two weeks ago. Anyway, so we're developing these really interesting ideas about how we might understand um, spatial cohesion and fission fusion um, across a wide variety of species. So here, um, Ari and, uh, and colleagues are taking an, the same approach of tagging all members of the group and monitoring their behavior in meerkats and coatis and also the hyenas, as I've just shown you. And these three species form somewhat of a continuum of, um, of cohesion where meerkats are really all together all the time. And as I've just shown you, the hyenas are much more flexible in their space use. And then looking forward, I'm also interested in implementing some of the, um, some of the the drone-based techniques for observing the behavior of, anim of wild animals to get a sort of more fine-scale glimpse of how these socio-spatial processes unfold within subgroups of hyenas. So here, what we're looking at is um, a hippo carcass in a pond. And these are some hyenas that are uh, sort of milling about. One of them is here feeding. This is not the most flattering image of hyenas I could have presented. But, um, but here, I'm interested in, under in using some of the drone-based techniques developed uh, here by some people in this room to, um, to understand the sort of fine scale um, social processes that govern how, uh, sp sorry, spatial processes that govern how social interactions unfold within subgroups of hyenas. And in particular, thinking about questions of um, behavioral contagion or how behavior spread among individuals in a subgroup, as well as um, synchronization or the uh, simultaneous um, posturing and movement of individuals that might, that I'm, um, 
that I think is a really important element of the sort of joint action and coalitionary alliances that I showed you uh, as being very important in this, these societies. And so um, here, the hyenas are relatively boring. But now I'm going to show you a more interesting um, video. And in this video, I'd like you to, um, to think about what we might learn from this kind of top-down perspective, where we can measure the spatial relationships among individuals. The, um, and I'd like you to think about the processes of conta behavioral contagion and synchronization in posture as we watch this. So here we're seeing a number of coalitions. Now we see aggression spreading to other members of the group. Anyway, so these are some ideas I'm thinking about in terms of, of my future directions. So that's about it for the talk today. I um, hope that what you've taken away from this is that a lot of what we can understand about hyena behavior occurs as a function of these sort of long-lasting social relationships among, un among individuals, and how other aspects of what occurs in these societies is more of an emergent process of these kind of more basic or um, widely acting processes that are somewhat irrespective of the identity of individuals. And I hope that um, you also have seen how integrating um, these collective behavior approaches into a long-term study can be a really powerful way for kind of bringing together these different lines of approach to understand how these systems work at various spatial and temporal scales. So I would now be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Eli, for this wonderful talk. And we're taking questions. Just continue passing on the mic. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about rank inheritance. Do you know if there's any data on whether or not coalitions also get passed down? Uh, so the, that's a great question. Um, I think that they do. There hasn't been any work that's demonstrated that they do. Uh, but there has been work demonstrating that the um, association preferences are passed down, so we can um, see how, how um, offspring tend to acquire social networks that look really similar to their mother. And, but this has been looked at in the context of association in subgroups, not in coalitions. But I, it's something that I'm really interested in doing because I expect that it would, and that certainly is what um, th this work implies. Yeah, I was wondering also if you can use the temporal and spatial data that you were showing like to see maybe if coalitions get passed down, does it also um, you know, do things like how long do they spend together, how often do they actually come back to form subgroups, like whether that also plays a role? Yeah, I, especially your last point there I think is really interesting because um, if we look in our long-term data, there we have, for instance, some individuals that our records indicate haven't had an aggressive interaction amongst them in years, which I think is likely not true, but we just miss so much of what's going on because we can only observe subsections of the group at one time, and we can't observe them all night when they're active, quite active in the night. So I think these, um, this yeah, spatial data is going to give us a really interesting first look into how like time spent apart is actually influencing social relationships when they come back together. Thank you so much. Go ahead, you have it. Great talk. <laughs> um, this is a super cool system, like just in terms of the rank inheritance and I, I assume like quite quite strong, you know, uh, yeah, differences in reproduction. And from a game theory perspective, it's it's pretty interesting. And I'm wondering 
what are some of the underlying kind of constraints that allow this to persist? Or, or do we think that this is a, a weird snapshot where it seems stable, but in the long term it will, it will break down? Well, I think it's got to be stable given that it's, that it's evolved in, in hyenas and also in, in old world monkeys. I think that there's, there, I think there, it has to be at a stable point here just because the chances of those things being in, this, uh, in a transient state um, seem so slim to me. In terms of, yeah, like how does it, how does that work? I, I agree it's a super fascinating question and one that I'm interested in, in further understanding. There are some theories about it, none that are specifically game theory, but um, you know, one hypothesis is that the, uh, well, I think there's, there's, there's sort of two questions. Why is behavioral inheritance exists? And then also why is it youngest ascendancy instead of oldest ascendancy? And um, I guess the, the hypotheses that I'm thinking about are related to the question of why youngest ascendancy. And there, I think there are like one um, potential explanation is that it could be a heuristic thing and that it's, uh, sim it's just a lot simpler to, um, to pass on rank via youngest ascendancy than oldest ascendancy because a, because if the mother is coalitioning with the offspring, so engaging in an alliance with the offspring, um, really she only has to convey, the only information that the offspring needs to learn is that everyone that the mother can dominate, I can also dominate. Um, however, if you have oldest ascendancy, then the, the offspring have to actually figure out, not they have to figure out how they relate to unrelated members of the group, but also kind of figure out this, um, figure out which of their relatives that their mother can dominate that they are not able to dominate. So I think there's potential heuristic explanation. Um, and there's also a question of sort of um, social power. So if, uh, if um, these coalitionary alliances are really strongly shaped by kin and uh, the mother is tr promoting her own alliances, um, by having the youngest offspring be most uh, allied with her and also highest ranking, it sort of prevents the possibility that she might be producing um, allies for her adult daughters who could then overtake her, if that makes sense. Cool. Thanks so much for the great talk, Eli. Um, I was really struck by what the ramifications of these uh, dominance trajectories are for life history. And I think this is what you, I suspect this is something that you're going to be moving towards in the future. So I guess I'm asking if you have any hints about how this is working. And I guess what, what struck me particularly is that if you're a high ranking female, your best, your, your highest rank is likely to be early in your life. And so investing heavily in reproduction during that window would seem to make strategic sense. Whereas if you're low ranking, you might go up, you might go down, but sort of moderating or potentially saving um, energy early on might make sense. And so do you actually see different investment in reproduction as a function of rank, but also rank by age? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I've, I've been thinking about along the same lines in terms of reproduction and sort of investing early in reproduction. I hadn't thought about it in the context of rank differences. Um, and that's an interesting point. We, you know, we definitely see rank differences in age at reproduction, but those have always been interpreted as sort of um, access to resources and the constraints of, of rank-related access to resources where high-ranking females are more well-fed and so they can reproduce earlier. However, um, I think, this, I think that you bring up a really good point and it's something that I, I have to think more about how we would test that hypothesis, but I wonder to what extent this could be driven by differential investment in reproduction rather than in, um, in sort of constraints of resource availability. Um, yeah, it's definitely a direction I'd like to go, and it's one in which I'm, my thoughts are still developing. So if you have any clever ideas for how to test this hypothesis, I would love to hear them. Cool, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask, I had trouble understanding the turnover passive um, effect, because in my opinion, if your rank goes higher when the dominant dies, the rank should get higher with time for all the individuals. So I did not understand why it goes down. <laughs> yeah, good question. So you're right. Like the, um, 
these demographic processes can cause individuals to move up if the ones above them die. Um, and they can cause them to move down if the ones above them reproduce and they, their offspring inherit that high position. So if we go back to, um, I think that this plot, this plot sort of is the easiest one for explaining it. So here, if you look at the KB match align, mm -hmm. basically what's happened is that she is, re she is really incredibly successful in terms of reproduction, and all of her offspring are being added to the top of the hierarchy. And every time this happens, it pushes everybody else down one position. Um, and so that's basically, what's, that's basically what's driving this downward decline, is that, um, is that all these new individuals, like most of the new individuals are being added to the top of the hierarchy instead of evenly throughout. OK, thanks. Yeah. Meg. I can't believe I've never asked this before. So what happened in 2001? Did, yeah. did, 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 everybody, did, did all other animals die? Or no. did, you finally get your, did you finally get your genetics in and they all got <laughs> slotted in? Or what happened there? No, there was a group fission. Ah, group fission. Yeah. Cool. Um, and that's kind of p part of the reason why they ended up in the other category is because they all left to join a new group. Yeah, we've got a question up here. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you covered this as part of the talks. Uh, I was wondering, what is the sensory or physiology basis of the rank? I mean, I think maybe this is also tangential to most of what you've talked about, but yeah, what creates it or how does an individual know or cause it to be behave this way and also therefore how does it get sort of uh, amplified through time? Yeah. I think, so I, my inclination is to say that it's like, it's largely social. Um, you know, we often think about rank in animal societies as being really reflective of individual characteristics, like the bigger one is higher ranked. And this is definitely true in a lot of species. Um, what, you know, we, what we discovered in um, in fact, what was emphasized in the early 20s when these dominance hierarchies were first described was that that, that sort of the individual characteristic, the characteristics of individuals, physiological or morphological, are often not actually that great pr predictors of position in the social hierarchy. Like they certainly do predict position in the social hierarchy, but there's a lot more to the story than that than simply, um, you know, <coughs> arranging individuals according to their to their intrinsic characteristics, and there have some been really some some really nice studies where, in for example, in um, I think in a species of wrasse, they created these social groups, and they were kind of um, they were harnessing the fact that that these wrasse have really poor memory of individual identity, so they could create a social group, see their ranks emerge among individuals, then separate them all into different containers, and then a few weeks later make the same social group again, and they'd find that actually the, the ranks of individuals across those two groups were rarely very similar. So, um, so I think, and I think in this system here, it's even less tied to individual characteristics because it's so socially embedded in these social networks. So. That said, there are a lot. There are some physiological differences, and um, among individuals of different rank. So, that, for example, um, there's a relationship between androgens and, and position in the social hierarchy. But these uh, relationships are, um, are are very noisy, and and the cause and effect is also always a little bit of a question. Great talk. Um, I was curious about the infanticide and if you had any idea who was committing the infanticide. Is it a higher ranking or a lower ranking individual and kind of what would you predict? Yeah, so the, the prediction um, we do and the prediction is that, that it should be the highest ranking individuals committing the infanticide um, and that's what we find. It's basically exclusively the very highest ranking members of the group and um, offspring of, of females distributed throughout the entire social group could be, were targeted by infanticide, but the ones committing the infanticide were almost exclusively the very top match line. Is the same true for siblicide? I thought that, I thought there was some evidence that there's quite a bit of siblicide that goes on in the, in the burrow before, before the pups emerge, even for the first time. Is that actually true, and is so anything known about it? That, um, that is thought to be, now, now thought to have been, uh, 
overstated. So the reason why people thought this is because, um, because hyenas have litters of one or two. And so it was um, potentially because of their somewhat unsavory reputation. It was often assumed, I think, that when they had a litter of one, that, the, that one of them had been killed inside the den. And so actually members of the other uh, members of the Mara Hyena Project did an, an ultrasound study where they ultrasounded adult females while they were pregnant to see how many cubs they had and relate their in utero um, number of offspring to how many eventually emerged. And they found that um, that is basically a pretty, a pretty good match. So there's not too much siblicide. The way siblicide does occur is that occasionally they have litters of three and hyenas have only two nipples. And when there's litters of three, the third one almost exclusive, almost always dies, except if it's the very, very highest ranking female. And, um, and so those are in general counted as siblicide because they're competitively excluded from, um, from nursing by other, mem by other offspring. And in, in areas that are a little bit harsher, you know, in the Masai Mara, there's lots of prey available, and it's a pretty, in general, pretty cushy living for a hyena. In other areas where living is less cushy, um, they sometimes see this sort of um, exclusion, exclusionary uh, siblicide, even in litters of two, where the dominant uh, of the litter will prevent the subordinate one from nursing, and then it dies. <coughs> Hey, um, whilst you've got this graph up, it looks mm -hmm. like something interesting is about to happen with all of the um, lower ranking individuals where you've got, uh, so for what you were talking about all the way through seems very much driven by the higher ranking individuals, whether they die or have offspring. But now you've got something happening here with all the lower individuals where there's mixing of match lines happening or uh, could something, What's going to happen? What do you predict could happen when really the focus at the moment is on the high rankers? What's, what's going on with all the low ranking individuals? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I would say that I haven't, I haven't dug into it, really. I wonder, so if we look at the relationship between reproductive success and rank, it's, it's a very sort of exponential looking relationship where the differences among these individuals in terms of their expected fitness is, is pretty small. And it's really once you get to the highest portion of the hierarchy where, where the effects of rank are become much more um, extreme. So I do wonder to what, to some, if to some extent the rank down here doesn't matter very much, um, especially given these decline, the sort of decline in rank over time that individuals experience. Like what, if your rank's 23rd or 24th and you're gonna sort of decline in rank over time, what's the big difference, right? So there, it could be that there's, um, that there's less riding on rank here, and thus it's a little bit noisier. Um, in terms of what's going to happen, well, this is, ends in 2014, so I can tell you what's going to happen, <laughs> is that this group is about to split into three different groups, because it's getting super large. So, um, Did they split by, uh, by color or match line here, or did they split by rank? What uh, happens with the mixing then? Yeah, we've had a, this is um, an area that I'm interested in looking, in, looking into. We, we in, so here, you can see that they kind of split by the portion of the hierarchy where the lowest ranking ones kind of all went off together. Um, that's not what happened in this case. But here, it also ultimately fissioned into four groups. So it was a little bit more complicated. Um, but yeah, different, different members of different match lines um, split up. Even sort of sisters ended up in different groups. It was a little bit more um, as a less obvious exactly how individuals decided which group to end in. Here, seeing that one, like half of the population belongs to like offspring, offspring from the same female, is there a risk of inbreeding then at some point? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So the males in, these, in this um, system, the males typically disperse. And so because of this male dispersal and because male um, because females mate multiply with lots of different males, the actual relatedness within the groups and even within match lines declines pretty quickly. So my guess is that um, if we were to compare relatedness of like this individual and the one at the top of that match line, that they're actually not that closely related. Um, and yeah, most males will tend to disperse um, and mate and reproduce in other groups. 
I was really intrigued by this small number that were challenging the hierarchy and they seem to be picking their moments really well. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea how they're doing that? How do they know when is the right moment? No. So um, that's a great question. And it's one that I'm sort of hoping that this, that the, if I end up doing this drone sort of study, I'm hoping that I'll be able to start asking some of those questions because I don't know if you saw from the, um, from the, well, if you, as you can kind of see in this image, like these coalitions involve kind of simultaneous movement and aggression. And um, well, we often, like sometimes we see kind of bandwagoning sort of stuff where this one will start to go threaten and then this one kind of decides, oh, me too. Um, but I think that these, that this sort of simultaneous emergence of a coalition is much more reflective of their social relationships. And so I'm thinking that like the, in addition to that, yeah, sort of your, to restate your question could be like, how do you build a strong alliance, right? And I think that it's something about how you can kind of get others on board and sort of build up from these low level synchrony um, in terms of posture and movement into these more impactful behaviors. And so I'd be interested to look at individuals in terms of how they vary in their ability to kind of get others on board with them. Um, we see a lot of sort of behaviors that seem to be kind of synchronous with no, with no point. So they'll do like synchronous sniffing. And sometimes we get, you know, you'll get a whole evening of hyenas walking around, sniffing the same spot and walking over here. And then they sniff the same spot. And here, when I, when I see that happening, I think like, you know, clearly they're building some, some, some coalition here. And, and so I, it's something that I'm really interested in looking at. Well, yeah. So thanks again. Right. Thanks. <laughs>